Thank you for giving me uh, the honor to preach on the Lord's Day, the day Jesus rose from the dead, which Christmas happens to fall upon. So today we celebrate both Jesus' birth and resurrection. So on that note, let's pray and call upon our God to help us hear his word. Father, you have given us your holy word. We ask you to open our hearts to pay attention to your word. Help me to preach your word with the help of the Holy Spirit. And we ask you that you would fill us with the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Peace. Shalom in Hebrew. Peace on earth. It's one of the key themes of Christmas. We read in Isaiah 9, For unto us is a child is born. He shall be called Mighty Counselor, Mighty God, Wonderful Counselor, and Prince of Peace. We write many songs about this, and for many of us, when we think about Christmas, we think about peace. Peace on earth. It's a joyous occasion. One song says this, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and mild and sweet their songs repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. We sing peace on earth because of the first Advent. Advent means coming. This is a first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. We read, as, we, as Peter read earlier in Luke 2, we saw that the angels sang when Jesus was born, peace on earth. Peace on earth. But some of you, perhaps many of you, don't feel the joyous occasion. You don't feel peace, especially when it comes to Christmas. The same song, it continues like this. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Better translation as Peter read, is peace on earth among men with whom he is well pleased. So for some of you, Christmas doesn't remind you of God's peace, but instead it reminds you of loneliness and despair because of someone you lost who used to sit right next to you, perhaps here in church, or someone who has abandoned you. For others, Christmas feels like chaos, family friction and hostility and even persecution. The other passage that Peter read, Jesus said that I, I did not come to bring peace on earth. Is he contradicting the angels that sang peace on earth? No, because right after that, he said, I've come to bring division, father from son, two against three, three against two. What he's saying is, for some of you, you will experience the peace of Jesus Christ. And because of the peace in you, there will be hostility around you for those who are hostile with God. And you feel that. You might not look forward to Christmas because you experience that hostility and that division. For others, for others of you, Christmas is just another opportunity to ignore the lack of peace and hostility in your heart. That is why you might enjoy all the restless and busy noise from Christmas shopping, Christmas place, Christmas events that you enjoy, and maybe even partake in in the busy season. All that noise makes it easy for you to ignore God's soft whisper to your heart who is calling you to the Prince of Peace. All the restless noise of Christmas 
makes it easy for you to ignore your restless heart. As Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O God. So for many of us, our lives, that busy lives, are often like Tom and Jerry or Nupagadi, as many of you know. These shows speak to the reality of creation. They are never-ending episodes of consistent fighting between a cat and a mouse and a wolf and a rabbit. We have in these shows Predator and Prey, Tom and Jerry, Wolf and Rabbit, and it could be also your dog and your cat, you and your brother, you and your mom, you and your mom-in-law. You can fill in the blank. It's just a cycle of this creation. It's anything but peace on earth. You might think there's no hope. Nothing is going to change. Well, I have some good news for you today from Isaiah 11. There is a sequel. There's a part two to the Tom and Jerry chaos of your life. There is hope for a part two to your life. And it's called this. The new creation. And only Jesus, can, the Prince of Peace, can bring it. The new creation is the sequel. So if you're writing notes, here's my main point. The main point is this. And it's the main point of the passage, which should be the main point of my sermon. And it's this. God is bringing about his new creation peace and rule through Jesus Christ. So set your hope in his glorious redemption. God is bringing about his new creation peace and rule through Jesus Christ. So set your hope in his glorious redemption. Turn with me to Isaiah 11. Isaiah chapter 11. And our main passage will be verses 6 to 16, but I'll read from just verse 1 to give us the historical context, and then we'll get straight to our passage. Isaiah chapter 11, and starts from verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Isaiah is writing this about 700 years before Jesus was born. And he's writing to a people who are hopeless, the Israelites. That's why he talks about a stump of Jesse. So Israel, in its glory days, it was explained to be like a tree, a glorious tree. You had, in the history of Israel, you had, remember, the kingdom of David and the kingdom of Solomon. You had one united kingdom. There's rest from God's enemies. But that was short-lived. Soon after Solomon, after Solomon's son, the next king, Israel was broken up into northern Israel and southern Israel. You had the ten tribes in the north and the two tribes in the south. And immediately they started worshiping golden idols in the north and in the south. Just like back then in the Exodus, when Moses was in Mount Sinai, they made the golden calf. So you, when you read the Old Testament, you see history in repeat. There's glory days. Then there's idolatry. God judges the people. And then he redeems the people. And then back and forth, back and forth. So the glorious tree was chopped down when northern Israel and southern Israel, they were split up, and the northern Israel was exiled. So all you have left is what? Read here in verse 1. It's a stump of Jesse. When you look at a stump, what do you think? It's over. There used to be a tree there. 
It was cut down or it fell down, and now no hope for that spot. And many people today, they remove the stump. But right here, notice, it says in verse 1, there shall come forth a shoot, a shoot from the stump of Jesse. What looks to be hopeless for the Israelites, there's a little shoot, a little branch that is going to come out of the stump. And you can search this up yourself. You can actually grow another tree from a stump. A shoot comes out, this branch, and then you have another tree. And here it says, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. So this is the context here. Israel is feeling hopeless. Half of them are exiled, and half of them are about to be judged by Babylon. So, let's get to our main passage, starting from verse 6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people. From Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The jealousy of Ephraim shall depart, and those who harass Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. But they shall swoop down on the shoulder of the Philistines in the west, and together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall put out their hand against Edom and Moab, and the Ammonites shall obey them. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt and will wave his hand over the river with his scorching breath and strike it into seven channels. And he will lead people across in sandals. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that remains of his people as there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. If you look here, the main character of this passage is the root of Jesse, the stump of Jesse. Well, who was Jesse? Jesse was David's father, King David's father. So if you look in the Old Testament with northern Israel and southern Israel, after King David and Solomon, all the kings, they were compared to someone prior to them. The good kings were compared to David, like Josiah. Josiah ruled righteously, and he was just like David did. But here, this ruler in Isaiah 11 is not talking about a person compared to David. Instead, it says it's going to be the stump of Jesse, the root of Jesse. None of the kings were compared to Jesse, David's father. The point here is this. This ruler is God who is also a new David. A new David, unlike the old David. Even far more glorious. So, before we dive into this passage, I'll mention the three points in the structure here to help us see the big picture. The three points of the sermon are this. Point number one, new creation Peace from verses 6 to 9. New creation peace. Point number two, signal for the nations. And point number three, redemptive remix. 
from verses 12 to 16. Most of our time will be spent in point number two, which is the core of this passage. And the first and the third point flow from point number two. So point number one, new creation peace. Let's read verses 6 and 7. And notice the two different groups here in this point. The two different groups. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. What are the two groups that you see here? It's predator and prey. Predator and prey. You have all these animals who are usually at odds with, an, with one another. But now they're at peace with one another. The wolf is dwelling with the lamb. Good luck finding that today. The lion is lying, is, the lion is laying down together with the fattened calf. A fattened calf. A juicy, meaty calf right next to a hungry lion. But they're not at odds with one another. There's peace. The lion instead is going to only eat straw. It's not going to eat animals or people. This is every vegetarian's dream right here. The new creation peace. So if you got a life verse, you could have it right here. It's right here. The lion and the lamb, the wolf and the lamb laying down together. There is hope for that in the future. But this is not only for the future, but this is also for now. This peace, this peace, it's also taken figuratively, as I'll explain soon. On top of all these animals, you see a little child shall lead them. In verse 6, a little child shall lead them. The ferocious animals, if you read earlier in Isaiah as well, like the lion and the wolf, they also represent the ferocious nations that oppose God's people and represent the chaos of sin. You can read that for yourself in Isaiah 5 and 6, and we'll see this soon. So not only that, but this passage is supposed to make us think back to another time where animals and man were at peace with one another. A little child is leading a bunch of animals. What does this make you think of earlier in the Bible? It's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, there was no sin, but only a peaceful rest in God's presence. God dwelled in the garden with Adam and Eve and the animals in perfect peace. In the old creation, the old creation before the fall, there was no sin. Remember, Adam named all the animals, all the lions, all the leopards, and maybe dinosaurs. I don't know how many animals, but, or how, they, how ferocious they were to him, but he named all of them. There's no fear. Animals did not fear man, and man did not fear animals. It was perfect peace. Yet all of Eden... All of that paradise, all of that rule of Adam was lost. The message here that Isaiah is saying is for Israel that God is establishing a new creation where you will have a little child just like Adam in the garden leading both predator and prey. It's amazing. Not only will a little child lead these animals, but look here in verse 8. The nursing child. The nursing child. A little baby shall play over the hole of the cobra, a snake. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den in the snake layer. The infant will play 
with the snake. What does this mean? All this talk about cobra, adder's den, infant, child, and the snake playing together. Again, after Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? God cursed the snake who was Satan. Satan was the one who tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. God tells Satan in Genesis 3.15 this, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The child of the woman shall bruise the head of the offspring of the serpent. And notice right here in the first part of the verse, it says, I will put enmity between you, hostility, division between you. And this is a first gospel promise because we see Jesus is the offspring of the woman. When he died, his heel was bitten by the serpent, by death, but in Jesus' death, death died, and the power of sin died, and the power of Satan was no more. No more enmity. And this is a picture that Isaiah is giving us. There's going to be no more enmity between the child and the cobra. There's going to be peace. It says here, there's going to be perfect peace. And to borrow a few illustrations, especially when you're reading the, the Bible, it's important to recognize the Bible, to borrow a few illustrations, it's like a Nike sign. What the Bible does a lot is it takes the point of history, like to the Israel and Isaiah, it goes back or down in the past, and then it slingshots to a new promise. Or if you like football, in order to hike the football, what does the quarterback do? It has to take a few steps back to then launch the ball forward. Or another one, it's like a dimmer switch. When you read from Genesis to Revelation, you see the unity of the Bible all pointing to Jesus, the root of Jesse, and slowly, slowly God turn, turns on the light. The Garden of Eden is like where, if it was dark air, you would see all the outlines of the furniture. You won't see everything clearly. I won't see your faces clearly. But as you go to, through the Old Testament to Isaiah, that dimmer switch turns on. And then you go to the New Testament and the gospel, it's full-on blast. And that's when you see Jesus Christ. And here is a picture of Jesus Christ. So always read your Bible, read big chunks, little chunks. See not only the leaves, but see the whole forest. So, like I mentioned, the infant playing with the snake, it's bringing us back to Jesus. And what Isaiah is saying is Jesus is reversing the curse of the old creation. Jesus reverses the curse of the old creation, and in himself, he's going to bring a new creation peace. And it's going to be far more glorious and far better than the rest enjoyed in Eden. As we see in verse 10, it's a, it's a glorious rest. All the violence between men will finally be over. No more wars. Wars between countries like Russia, Ukraine, and all other wars. No more wars between you, Christian, and those close to you who you feel very divided, who are not Christians, and yet are trying to reach out to them. Look in Isaiah eleven nine. 9. It says this, as a result of Jesus reversing the curse. No longer will anyone be hurt in God's holy mountain. And the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. The earth won't be filled with violence anymore. Like it was in Noah's time and today. This phrase here, the earth shall be full of, word for word, exactly in the Hebrew, is used only one other place. And it's in Genesis 6 when it said, before the flood, the earth was filled with violence. With violence. Instead of the knowledge of the Lord, 
The earth was filled with violence. And what happened? God destroyed the world with the flood. It's as if it was a new creation all over again. And now we have Noah, a righteous man, coming out into this new world. But what's one of the first things that happened with Noah? He sinned in a vineyard, just like Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden. It's on repeat again. So physical circumstances won't change the world because there's still sin in man's heart. The earth instead with Jesus Christ shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, full of peace in his new earth, his new creation. But first, it's not just the future. God must fill up your heart with his knowledge. God is establishing lasting peace with his new creation rule. It's actually going to last forever. It's going to last forever. Or there will be no more violence and no one hurt. And where will this peace begin? It says on God's holy mountain. Where Jesus died on the cross in Jerusalem. And the new Jerusalem. The Israelites experienced a lot of violence from these nations around them. From Assyria and Babylon. The nations were predators and Israel was like the prey. And the Israelites, when they were exiled, kicked out of the land, just like Adam and Eve was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. The Israelites probably thought, you know what? Once I get to the promised land back, once I rebuild the temple, once we figure out our finances and get the perfect house, get that exact land we were looking for, when we get back to Israel, God will finally dwell with us. There's finally going to be peace. Was that when the peace of the Garden of Eden was restored? No. Because you see, after the exiles returned, the people still sinned. They still committed idolatry, even after they rebuilt the temple. One of my professors always used to say this. You can take the people out of Babylon, but you can't take the Babylon out of the people. You can take the people out of Babylon back into Israel, but you can't take Babylon out of the people. So what do you need? You need a new heart. You need a new heart, not new circumstances to experience Jesus' new creation peace. And if you are not a believer here today, and you're visiting, perhaps exploring Christianity, and you've seen this yourself, and you might think circumstances will finally get everything in order for you, will give you peace, know that you need the root of Jesse to wrap his roots around your heart and make you completely new. You need a new heart not a new job. You need a new heart, not a new house, not a new city, not a new land. You can take the people out of California, but will California be taken out of you? Don't let the disturbances and the enmity you feel, even from your own rulers, Even lovely Gavin Newsom make you think it's his fault that you're experiencing hostility and enmity. It's your heart. You need a new heart. So what is your heart filled with? What is your heart filled with? Is it filled with violence or peace? With lust or love? A self-sacrificial love. With anger against God or anger against your sin. I would like you to see the story of Israel as a warning. It is a warning that shows you can't have God. You can't have peace with God based on your circumstances. Those things will not bring you lasting peace. Maybe for a moment, but not lasting peace. We see that with Israel. 
They just kept sinning and sinning, even after God's judged them over and over again, and even after he blessed them over and over again and rescued them over and over again. And not only is this applied to you, unbelievers, but it's also to you, church. Bright church and members of other churches. I would like to encourage you to display the new creation, peace, and rule of Jesus Christ by showing everyone how you love one another. The church is the best place, the brightest place today where the world can see new creation peace, how God's peace really looks like. No one will understand the peace in your heart if you're literally living by yourself in a desert because we all have sin remaining in us. If you clash two sinners together and two people who claim to be believers together, the world will see, is there really peace in your heart? Are you at peace with your fellow church members? Colossians 3.15 says this. Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. He's writing this to the church. One body. One body. In Ephesians 2, verses 14 to 15, is even more explicit. It says this. For he, Jesus, himself, is our peace, who has made us both one, Jew and Gentile, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments, expressing ordinances. That what? That he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. The church today, you are the new man created the new creation of Jesus Christ visible to the world. So how can you have enemies in your own church, fellow church members, when you say the, that the blood of Jesus, the root of Jesse, gave you peace? How can the nations expect to have peace with God if you can't, have, can't even have peace in your own heart with each other as you claim to follow Jesus? So be warned and be encouraged. You have a great calling as a church member, as one body of Jesus Christ. So how will this new creation peace come about? The answer is in verses 10 and 11. This is point number two, the signal for the peoples. The signal for the peoples. Let's read in verse 10. In that day... The root of Jesse, there we have it again, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples. Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. And that day is basically signifying that something big is going to happen. This is 700 years before Jesus Christ. And he's pointing, he's prophesying what Jesus will do 700 years before he did it. It says he's going to be a signal for the peoples. What is a signal? What is a signal? One Bible dictionary says this. A banner or signal was usually a flag or a carved figure of an animal, bird, or reptile. It may have been molded from bronze as was a serpent in Numbers 21 verses 8 to 9. In Numbers 21, you had the serpent, the bronze serpent on top of the pole. The pole is the same word in Hebrew for signal. It's the same thing. It's a flag, a signal, something to get attention. But what what was the meaning of it? What, What was the purpose of this signal for the people? Well, soldiers rallied around this signal, especially in battle. So the signal... Or banner, it meant that judgment is coming soon. The signal meant that judgment is coming soon. 
Read, just flip two chapters later, Isaiah 13, 1 to 3. This is a prophecy about judgment that's coming. It says this. The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. On a bare hill, a holy mountain, raise a signal. Cry aloud to them. Wave the hand for them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger, my proudly exulting ones. God is saying that there's a signal raised and Babylon, a hundred years later or so, is about to judge Israel. So in Isaiah 11, it says, the root of Jesse, which we see is Jesus, shall stand for the, shall stand as a signal for the peoples. For the peoples, a signal for the nations. So if you have a signal here, you have coming judgment. Doomsday. But in Isaiah 11, who is going to be judged? Who is going to be judged and experience the almighty wrath and anger of God? All the nations gather around this signal. Surely it must be the wicked Babylonians, Egyptians, Assyrians. All the nations gathering around this signal. Or maybe it was Israel themselves. No. The judgment of God was ultimately poured out on the signal itself, on the root of Jesse. You see this clearly with Jesus. He is the root of Jesse, the new David, who comes from David's lineage. This very passage in Isaiah points straight to the gospel of John. And Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 31 to 32, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I... When I am lifted up, standing from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus being lifted up from the earth, like the serpent on that pole, on that signal, on the holy mountain, Jerusalem, Jesus is the signal for the peoples, for the nations. Jesus was lifted up from the earth on the cross, To bear the judgment that we deserve. We are the nations gathering around Jesus Christ. And we have to experience all of the wrath. But instead we see it on God's chosen son. The prince of peace. Mighty God. Wonderful counselor who had no one to be counseled by. Who's all alone on the cross. Jesus willingly made himself to be a flag, a signal to show us his own love for us on the cross as he took the judgment that we deserve upon himself. That's why he has the crown of thorns. It's a picture to point us back to the, the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, it said, you shall deal with thorns and thistles. And now Jesus is taking this curse on his head, but not. But that's not all. That's not all the pain. It's to show that there's a greater pain. It's the pain of God's everlasting judgment that we deserve in hell forever and ever. And that's why when Jesus was on the cross, all of creation was groaning. The earth was shaking. It was quaking. And it got dark for three hours. The prince of peace has died, so all creation groaned. It was a hanging on the tip of a balance. It's as if everything was going to be utterly destroyed, but instead the only one who was destroyed was the one who was Jesus Christ on the cross. The prince of peace has taken the sin of all those who would repent, and he has taken the wrath of God upon himself. So you need a new heart. You need to believe in this message, unbelievers and believers. And three days later, Jesus rose from the dead with a new body. On the first day of the week, death could not hold him. 
The curse of death could not hold him because Jesus is a perfect prince of peace, God and man. And he rose from the dead on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. It's the first day of a new week, and he has a new body. Why? To bring new creation peace to you who believe in him. One of the first words he said to the disciples after his resurrection is, peace to you. Peace to you. The peace is not just in the future, but it's today as well for your heart. So, what is the, role, what is the result of all that Jesus did for us on the cross? Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. God rested on the seventh day. Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the new week to give us a glorious rest, a new creation rest. And it's actually going to last, not like what happened with the history of Israel. So again, if you're exploring Christianity, don't yet follow Jesus. Inquire of Jesus. Look to him at the cross and in heaven He's the signal for your salvation. If you say sorry for your sins and trust in him as Lord and Savior, see the beauty and glory of Jesus' reign. Submit under his kingship, under his rule. Be led by him. Don't fight against God. Don't be a ferocious animal in enmity with God, but Follow him. Ask him to give you a new heart and enjoy this glorious rest. I once met, when I lived in Minnesota, a guy named Jojo. And I was at a bus stop coming from work. And I prayed to God, God, open a door for the word to enter. Like, I have time here. And this guy comes down. And he looked all flustered and like, oh boy, God is answering my prayer. Be careful when you pray. God's going to answer your prayer. And he answered there right there. And this guy comes in flustered. And he's like right away. He's pouring out his heart to me. He's like, hey, man, my girlfriend just kicked me out of my house. Um, And like, man, what do I do? Um, And first first thing he mentioned after that, he's like, hey, do you have any weed? I, I I need some weed to satisfy me and calm me down. And I told him. You know what satisfies me? Jesus Christ. And right when I mentioned Jesus Christ to him, he just unloaded his past on me. He's like, first thing he said, and this is odd because usually when when I preach to people, most of the people say, oh, I'm good. Um, I don't need Jesus. I, I have my circumstances. Everything's good. I have a clean, perfect heart. But this guy, right away, he just unloads and says, first thing, how can Jesus forgive me? How can he want me? And then he said, I'm a gangbanger. I've shot people. I've done this. I've done that. I've dealt drugs. I've done this to women. And I'm like, whoa, I got to rewire my brain here. I can't just give him the law. I got to give him some good news. And I told him, I pointed him to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I told him, your violent past, you see yourself as a sinner. You're the perfect candidate for the gospel. You're exactly the person that Jesus came for. Jesus said, I did not come for the righteous, but the sinner. Not for the healthy, but the sick. And I said to him in 2 Corinthians 5, I read him this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. And I told him that old life, that old creation, violent, friction, ferocious past of yours passes away when you are in Christ. And right when I said to him, behold, the new has come. He repented right when I said the new has come in the moment. I'm just reading the passage there. So all of us, all of us Christians, you are a new creation. The new has come. And if you're an unbeliever, your old has passed away. We struggle, but we get back up as new creation. And we're going to get a new body someday. 
But the important part is, do you have a new heart today? Do you have a new heart? Just like Jojo, experience the power of the new creation today. And one of the first things he said after he got saved is this. Hey, man, I feel so much peace in my heart. I feel so much peace. And then we got off, we got off the bus and got off the same stop. And this stop used to be one of the most dangerous corners of gang violence in the country to in downtown Minneapolis. And he just sat down in peace. He just randomly sat down, just like the guy who had the legion of demons in him. Remember, Jesus sent out the demons, and just it said he sat down in his sound, healthy, peaceful mind. And across the street, you had his former posse, this, like this gang, asking him for drugs. And right away, he's like, I ain't about that life anymore. I ain't about that life anymore. And if you don't trust in Jesus, you can say the same thing. I ain't about that life anymore. The old has passed away. The new has come. So, verse 11, look back with me to Isaiah 11. In that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time. And he mentions that the remnant, that the saved, like Jojo and you today are coming from all these nations, Assyria, Egypt, Pathras, Shinar. Shinar is actually where Babylon, uh, the Babylonians are from. The main point that Isaiah is saying is that God is saving a people from anywhere and anybody. No matter how violent the nation is, no matter how violent you are in your heart, God can save you. And he's gathering these people around his signal. He can save anyone And anywhere. So Christian. Pray for your persecutors. Look at all these nations. God is purchasing, redeeming a people from them. God can save anybody. God can save Gavin Newsom. God can save Biden. God can save Trump. God can save whatever politician you can think of. Because what? God saved Nebuchadnezzar, the ruler of Babylon, the most ferocious nation at that time. God saved Nebuchadnezzar, and he saved Paul, who used to persecute the church in the New Testament. Pray for your persecutors. The very person you think is unsavable is is exactly the one that God might just save. God loves to surprise us with his grace. He can save anyone. There is still hope. So don't be hopeless. Don't be hopeless. It's something I struggle with all the time. Don't be hopeless for your family member, your lost family member, that old friend, maybe your own spouse, husband or wife. Don't forget them. Call them to look to Jesus Christ. Pray, pray, and pray unceasingly to God. I can't guarantee anything, but I know who God is. He's a gracious God, and he works wonders through his people and through your prayers. There is still hope. So brothers and sisters, abound in hope for those who persecute you and your unbelieving family, friends, and workers. He can save anyone Just like Jojo, he'll surprise you with grace and you might have to rewire your brain to think, I gotta mention all these good news that God will cleanse you. So point number three, that was point number two, a signal for the nations. Jesus is a signal who bears our judgment. And point number three, redemptive remix. This is our last point, redemptive remix. I call these verses here a redemptive remix because notice in the history of Israel, this is on replay, but rewinded. This passage here is replaying Israel's history, but it's starting from the end and going forward. So remember, let's look in verse 12 first, and now I'll mention the point about the history of Israel. It says in verse 12, He will raise a signal for the nations and will gather the banished of Israel and the dispersed of Judah from the ends of the earth. 
So remember, Israel, they had the exodus. They were redeemed by God at the exodus. Then they conquered the land in the Philistines. They had the united kingdom under David and Solomon. And then that kingdom split. So now he's starting backwards, saying how the kingdom split and going to the beginning of Israel. Here it says he will gather the banished of Israel. Remember, northern Israel, they're split. And the dispersed of Judah. He's going to unite them. So he's focusing inwardly. And he says in verse 13, the jealousy of, of Ephraim shall depart. Ephraim is a tribe in the north, right? It's a tribe in the north. And those who harass Judah in the south shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah. And Judah shall not harass Ephraim. There's going to be peace, the wolf and the lamb. Now, let's work our way backwards to verse 14. Remember the conquest. But they, Israel, shall swoop down on the shoulders of the Philistines in the west. United Israel. Now, going through the conquest of the land, and together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall put out their hand against Edom and Moab. It's in the east. And the Ammonites shall obey them. Notice, the kingdom of Israel is being united in the middle, and they're slowly expanding. It's slowly going backwards. This is a new conquest, and it's a new exodus, finally and fully achieved by God. Now, rewind the tape a bit more. What was the, one of the first events of Israel that is constantly repeated in the Old Testament? It's the exodus. So, we rewinded the tape a bit in verse 15, and it says here, And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt, and will wave his hand over the river with the scorching breath, and strike it into seven channels, and he will lead people across in sandals. When he, we had the exodus with Israel, there was just one path, right? The waters were on both sides. But here it says, there's not going to be any water. The new creation, new exodus rule, the better exodus of Jesus Christ, it's going to be sevenfold glory, seven channels, a number of perfection. The point that Isaiah is making is this, if you didn't catch some of that, is that the power and reach of God's rule in this new exodus is going to be far more glorious. Far more glorious. This is a sevenfold more glorious exodus from the root of Jesse, who has the spirit of the Lord upon him. He will lead people across in sandals, just like the child led the animals. This river is the Euphrates River. And this is where the new exodus and the remnant will come from the exile. The point here is this. God is not only going to redeem you and save you, no matter how horrible your past is, but he's going to remix your life. A redemptive remix. And I see this plenty of times from fellow Christians. God doesn't just redeem you, but he remixes you. He takes the very sin that we struggle with, and he changes it completely upside down. And now we conquer this sin. For example, I know a man who used to be a drug addict. He ends up getting saved, and now he's the one reaching out to all the other drug addicts and all his old friends. The very same people who experienced the same struggle he, with, he, he did. And I know a woman who was involved in the porn industry. She ends up getting saved and becomes one of the loudest and leading voices against this sinful, wicked industry. I know of another couple that I've met in church who committed abortion. They murdered their baby in the womb, their unborn baby. They regretted it, they repented, and they gave their testimony in church, and it was a beautiful testimony. It was a beautiful testimony of how God redeemed them and completely changed and remixed them with this new creation piece. Now what she, the husband and the wife, they're leading voices in a ministry called Speak for the Unborn, and now they are there making sure no one else makes the same sin. God beautifully and miraculously takes our old sinful history like Israel and remixes it 
as his beautiful, glorious redemption story. So, unbelievers and believers, set your hope in Jesus' glorious redemption. Look to Jesus at the cross. Ask God to continue to, redeem, to remix you and point to Jesus as a signal for the nations, high and lifted up on the cross. And not only there, but higher, lifted up in heaven. Because he's ruling and reigning with his perfect peace, the Prince of Peace, right now. Let's pray. Lord, give us peace in our hearts as one body and help us as we have Christmas dinner with our families and friends to reach out people with the gospel and to love one another with this perfect peace. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.